All right. All right. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, for tonight's Warwick Lecture. I'm Blake Wintry, Director of Preservation Education at the Heritage Foundation. Um, since 1967, the Heritage Foundation of Williamson County has been dedicated to preserving Williamson County's architectural, geographic, and cultural heritage. As part of that dedication, the Warwick Lecture Series, named for Williamson County's uh, historian, Rick Warwick, highlights Middle Tennessee history, architecture, preservation, and authors. So we're going to tick several of those boxes tonight with uh, Leanne Gardner and her friend and colleague, Rachel Finch, is going to introduce her. Thanks, Blake. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Finch, and I'm the Senior Director of Preservation and Education for the Heritage Foundation of Williamson County. And I'm very pleased tonight to introduce to you for our 2022 lecture series, our, our first speaker, Leanne Gardner. She and I are, are friends and colleagues that go back to our time at MTSU and the Heritage area. Um, and so Leanne, they received her MA in History with an emphasis in public history from MTSU. She developed an interest in documenting African-American history during her time at the Center for Historic Preservation at MTSU, both as a graduate student and then later as a staff member. She spent over a decade documenting African-American benevolent and fraternal groups and their cemeteries in Tennessee. Her book on the subject, To Care for the Sick and Bury the Dead, African-American Lodges and Cemeteries in Tennessee, will be released by Vanderbilt University Press this month. And I am so excited that my book will be coming in the mail in two days. Um, so everybody hop on Amazon or your favorite online bookstore and go rush to buy to care for the sick and bury the dead because it's going to be worth your time in reading and investing in this incredible history. And Leanne, we are so glad to have you here tonight. And we've been talking about your presentation in the office for the past few weeks. So we are wonderful. Uh, we're ready to hear you present. So it's all you. Thank you so much, Rachel and Blake, and to everyone for um, coming out tonight virtually and hearing me talk about my research. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about my book, To Care for the Sick and Bury the Dead, African-American Lodges and, and Cemeteries in Tennessee. So to set the stage for my discussion tonight, I want to share a story with you that I think really highlights the importance of fraternal and benevolent groups in Tennessee. In April of 1909, members of the African American Knights of Pythias Lodges in Nashville prepared to celebrate their 45th annual Thanksgiving celebration. Um, this was usually a sermon that was preached and there were other things that happened as well. Before the celebration even began, organizers realized they had a problem. They did not have one venue large enough to accommodate the number of men and women that they expected to attend the event. So they decided to split the event into two and to hold it at two different locations, St. John's A&E Church and uh, Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church, both located at that time on Cedar Street, which is now Charlotte Avenue in downtown Nashville. Two separate sermons were gonna be preached um, with the Missionary Baptist preacher speaking at the AME church and an AME preacher speaking at the Missionary Baptist Church. Members of the lodges could decide which um, event that they wanted to go to. The idea was that it was the same event but just held in two different spots with two different preachers. The Nashville Globe, um, an African-American paper, described the attendance at the event saying, for an entire block, one solid surging mass of excuse me, one solid mass of surging humanity lined Cedar Street, unable to gain admittance to either church. It is estimated that approximately 5,000 people took part in this Thanksgiving celebration. So to set the stage for this, in 1910, Nashville's population is about 110,000, 110,600. 110, and its African-American population in Nashville was 36,500. So if 5,000 people really did attend this celebration, that means that four and a half percent of Nashville's total population or 13.7% of its African-American population attended this one Thanksgiving sermon held at these two churches. And I think that really highlights just how important benevolent and fraternal lodges were in Tennessee that so many people attended this event. So African-Americans in Tennessee and across the nation, in fact, created a host of lodges in the years following emancipation. There are three main types, 
fraternal, benevolent, and insurance. But my research really focuses primarily on fraternal and benevolent lodges. Um, the type of lodge that people are most familiar with would be the fraternal lodge. The primary focus of a fraternal lodge was a meeting ritual, as well as a regalia that members would wear during the ritual. Fraternal lodges usually also had graduated levels of membership so that members could kind of work their way up through the ranks. In addition to having a ritual and special clothing, um, fraternal lodges also stressed um, the importance of the bonds of brotherhood or sisterhood and really the importance of keeping the lodge secret, like what went on there secret. Now they could also offer offer their members benefits like a sickness benefit or a burial benefit, but that was not the group's primary purpose. Their primary goal is really um, for, like fraternalism and having a ritual and regalia and coming together in that way. They often had, they were usually for men, but they often had an auxiliary for females. So for the Masons, they had an auxiliary for female, which is the Order of the Eastern Star. Um, for the Knights of Pythias, their female auxiliary was the Court of Coenthe. So many of the African-American lodges in Tennessee were often counterparts to their white organizations. Um, and that's because of the segregation of the time. White organizations would not admit African-Americans to membership. And so African-Americans would usually do one of a couple of things. They would either um, apply to a lodge in England to get a, a lodge created for African-Americans. So that is what happened with the Masons and the Odd Fellows. Uh, they got permission from English lodges to create African-American counterparts. Sometimes they would obtain the ritual of the white um, parallel organization and create a parallel organization, such as with the Elks. They were able to get a copy of the ritual from the Library of Congress and create an entirely parallel organization. The other type of lodges that I've studied and document are benevolent lodges. And they differ from fraternal groups in a number of ways. Their primary purpose is to bring people together who are coming together for a common goal. Sometimes that goal was to provide economic security for their members. So that could be the form of a, some sort of like uh, economic safety net. Like if you get sick, they will offer you a sickness benefit at work. Um, if something happens to you and you die, they will bury you for your family. Sometimes uh, benevolent groups, their purpose was something to create a better society or to fight some societal evil, such as temperance. So the, really a benevolent lodge, their purpose is a group of people who come together for a common, to achieve a common goal. Now they often also have special clothes or rituals, which can kind of be confusing at times, but that's not their primary purpose. There are benevolent lodges across America and Tennessee, uh, many which started before the Civil War, uh, both in white society and African-American society. A number of immigrant groups, um, such as the Irish and the Germans, created benevolent groups uh, in order to help their member, new immigrants assimilate to American society. Um, in Tennessee, there were a number of these. There it was the Knoxville Hebrew Benevolent Society, uh, which was active in 1869. There was the Chattanooga Turn Marine, which I just murdered that German pronunciation, which was a German gymnastics group for like German immigrants. Irish had the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick. Um, and so in addition to all those ethnic types, there's also the African-American benevolent groups. And there are many of them in Tennessee. Those included the Benevolent Society, the Sons and Daughters of Charity, the Sons and Daughters of Cyrene. And the interesting thing about African-American benevolent groups is that they're often distinctive and they're not based on a white counterpart. Um, and sometimes they grow up and they're just in one specific location, maybe in one town in Tennessee. Sometimes they will um, spread throughout the state and some benevolent organizations such as the Independent Order of Immaculates actually start in Tennessee as a benevolent group and spread out to multiple other states. So for more than a decade, I've worked to try to document all the different types of African-American lodges that existed in Tennessee between 1865 and 1930. In my ignorance, when I first started, I thought I would be able to document this in maybe a year or two. Um, but here over a decade later, later, I'm still working to try to figure out how many groups there were at that time. 
to date, I have found evidence of more than 100 different types of groups with more than 700 lodges across the state. And there's a map here that's just showed that I've created just to show some of the lodges that existed in the state. Uh, lodge groups in Tennessee, and this is just a partial list of the ones that are documented included groups like the Benevolent Society, which had lodges across the state, or the Working People's Labor Aid Association, which really seemed to be um, confined to Middle Tennessee. There were the Elks, there's the Independent Order of Good Samaritans, um, there were the Knights of the Wise Men, uh, the Independent Order of Pole Bearers, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute because they're really fascinating. And so this is just a small sample of the different groups that are across the state. Another thing that I found as I was doing my research is that I really wanted to try to document the physical remains of these lodges, like what remained on the landscape. And what I soon learned is one of the things that really remained were cemeteries, which I was not expecting. A number of African-American benevolent and fraternal lodges organized cemeteries for the benefit of their members. Now, some of these cemeteries are no longer owned by the lodge, um, are offer, operate more as a community cemetery now, but I have found them in more than tw uh, between 20 and 30 communities across the state, um, any, everywhere from, uh, any, from Memphis um, to Agnew, which is in Giles County. Um, they are um, Odd Fellows, there's the Sonic one, to other, to benevolent society lodges. And I suspect there are a lot more than the ones I've documented. I just don't think um, we're always aware that there are certain African-American cemeteries that were actually created originally by an African-American lodge. And one group in particular that created a lot of African-American cemeteries was the benevolent society. It's not entirely clear when the benevolent society got their start in Tennessee, um, some sources say that they organized in 1865 in Nashville, but their 1890 constitution states that the group organized in 1853 in Nashville. Whatever their start date, by 1866, they had incorporated, and by 1868, they had amended that Articles of Incorporation to allow them to create lodges throughout the state, which they did. And in addition to their lodges, there's a host of African of Benevolent Society cemeteries located in Middle Tennessee. And I've documented, and here's a map that shows uh, the ones I've documented um, from Port Royal, um, which is an active benevolent society that still meets, um, all the way down to Mount Ararat in Shebbel, which was started by a ladies benevolent organization, which is no longer owned by the organization. So now I'm just gonna speak briefly about some of the cemeteries that I documented um, while I was working on my book and across the state. So the black and white pictures here show the number nine Hall Cemetery in rural Shelby County. It's about a mile and a half from the Mississippi state border. And they were created by the Independent Pole Bearers Lodge number nine. And the Pole Bearers are a really fascinating group. They started in Memphis as a semi-military organization with the right to bear arms. And in fact, they seem to make white Memphians quite nervous in the years immediately following the Civil War. There's a lot of newspaper articles um, that describe them as bullies and was very concerned about that they were patrolling in the streets and just exactly what their purpose was. By the 1880s, they had really become more of a benevolent group that existed to provide benefits for their members. Um, it, the Lodge Number no. 9 uh, was created in 1896 in what was a rural area by a number of farmers. Um, and it's interesting, their cemetery is still very rural today. Another interesting cemetery that I found was um, Agnew Benevolent Cemetery um, in rural Agnew community in Giles County. So that community dates to the early 1800s. The cemetery was created by the Benevolent Society in 1903. It's located right beside the St. Paul AME Agnew Church. And in fact, some records erroneously describe the cemetery as being the St. Paul Agnew cemetery, but it's not. Um, and what's also interesting, and I found this several times um, during my research. So uh, when I first documented the site back in 2012, there was no sign at the cemetery to indicate its name or who had started it. When I went back to the cemetery in 2020 to see it again, um, so some 
one in the interim had erected this sign that I have pictured here um, that says it was established in 1904 by the Benevolent Society. So in addition to rural lodge cemeteries, there are also a number of lodge cemeteries located in our major cities. Uh, an example is the Sons of Ham Cemetery in Madison, um, in Davidson County. So the, you can't see it, but the cemetery is actually bordered by Dry Creek and the Sons of Ham had created a lodge in about 1873 in Dry Creek. Um, but they became inactive due to the panic of 1873 because they had uh, deposited all their funds into the Freedmen's Bank and they lost all their money. Some point after that, they reformed, they were able to buy land and create the cemetery. And their hall and, and also built a lodge building. Um, you can't, I think the lodge building was probably located in where the tree line is. There, there are no remnants that I can find of it anymore. Um, it's, it's an interesting cemetery in that up here on the hill are the oldest burials, some of which date to 1869. And then when you go down the hill, there are recent burials. Like I've, every time I've ever gone to the cemetery, which is multiple times, there's always seems like there's been a recent burial as well. Um, the Sons of Zion Cemetery is probably one of the most well-known lodge cemeteries um, in Memphis, if not the state. It was created by the Sons of Zion in Memphis in 1876. It has about 30,000 burials in it. Um, they also, the Sons of Zion also own Zion Hall, which is a two-story lodge building on Beale Street. Um, it's huge, it's 15 acres in size and has eight separate named sections. Um, in the 1890s, the lodge organization actually deeded, created a separate corporation, um, not the lodge, to manage the cemetery and deeded the cemetery to, to them, um, which owned the cemetery until the last member of the corporation died in 1976, at which point, um, excuse me, in 1986, it became part of the CME church. And the monument pictured here, belong to Reverend Morris Henderson. He's a very famous African-American preacher from Memphis. He was the preacher at Beale Street Baptist Church, which is considered the mother church of most Baptist congregations in Memphis. And after he died in 1877, the community uh, raised money and erected a monument at his grave, uh, which included a um, five foot figure representing hope. And as you can see, the figure no longer stands on top of his grave and in fact is missing its head, but it is still there in the cemetery. Another interesting thing that I found as I was documenting large cemeteries was that you could still see the presence of segregation um, at these cemeteries. So Mount Ararat Cemetery um, over here uh, is a great example. So in the foreground is Mount Ararat Cemetery. It was created by the Ladies Benevolent Society Lodge number 44. Um, on the other side of the fence and with the two roads in between them is an older white cemetery known as Bull Mount that was started before the Civil War. And it's um, so interesting that both cemeteries um, serve the same community but were segregated. And that's why the Ladies Memorial Society had to create Mount Ararat Cemetery in Shebbul. Um, another interesting case of segregation I found was in Benevolent Society Cemetery number 16, which is in Davidson County in Goodlettsville. It is literally adjacent to a white cemetery named, known as Cole Cemetery um, that's older. Some of the burials in Cole Cemetery date to the 1860s and the Benevolent Society Cemetery didn't, uh, wasn't established until 1885. However, when you walk the two cemeteries, there are no longer any physical remnants of the barrier between the two, but they're clearly two separate cemeteries. They have two different deeds. Uh, they have different cemetery transcriptions. Uh, I, my sense is that these two little pillars here may have represented a gate between the two cemeteries at one point. And it raises an interesting point that why myself, an observer from over a hundred years later, I can no longer know what those segregated boundary lines were, but for the community who used these cemeteries, they would have been blindingly clear, blindingly aware of where the lines between the two cemeteries were. I've also worked to document lodge buildings across the state, and there are several of them left, uh, some still in active use by their lodges. 
Uh, the Warfield Lodge is the Masonic Lodge in Clarksville, located on 9th Street. Um, it's still active. The build, this um, three story brick building, dates to 1913. It replaced a building that was burned down in a fire. And the Elks Lodge building um, in Knoxville still remains. So there are still lodge buildings across the state. Most of them that have survived seem to be associated with fraternal lodges rather than benevolent lodges. Some buildings, however, have not fared as well. Um, one example of this is at Benevolent Society Cemetery number 84, and that's in Davidson County. Um, it's near Antioch, where I grew up, uh, in the Hamilton Church area. So we know that Benevolent Society Lodge 84 um, was a, like a small farming community when the Benevolent Society created a lodge there. We don't know exactly when they created their lodge or even established their cemetery, um, but we think it dates back to at least 1909. I do know in 1926 that the lodge had 38 members and owned property valued at over $1,200. And as part of their cemetery, there was a small lodge building when I first documented the site in 2013. Um, as you can see, it was just a, a very simple concrete block building. Um, at the time I first surveyed it, it was missing its um, roof. It was also missing a large chunk out of the rear of the building, but it was still standing. Uh, in the winter of 2014, 2015, the building collapsed and the debris is still remaining on the site today, or at least it was last uh, spring when I last visited it. And it really highlights some of the um, dangers some of these cemeteries and lodge buildings face um, as the benevolent lodges uh, lost members are no longer were active, their buildings were sometimes abandoned and left to neglect and dereliction. Other uh, lodge buildings sometimes meet with uh, burn. So when I first visited the uh, number nine lodge cemetery, which the independent pole bearers had created in Memphis in rural Shelby County, uh, they had a small lodge building still at the side of their cemetery. And that's another interesting thing. Several of these lodge cemeteries have a lodge building either within the cemetery or immediately adjacent to the cemetery. Um, in 2018, the Independent Pole Bearers Lodge caught on fire. Um, I don't believe it was arson. It, it caught on fire on Christmas evening, on Christmas morning, excuse me. Um, they have not rebuilt the building. Uh, they instead elected to build a picnic pavilion, uh, which better serves their membership today. And an interesting um, lodge that still remains and is still active, one of the only benevolent societies that I can find that still meets regularly is the Benevolent Lodge Number 210 up in Port Royal in Montgomery County. And they first established a lodge way back in 1872 um, in a log cabin. And in 1890, they purchased um, a lot in the town of Port Royal and created a lodge building. But by 1908, for whatever reason, they decided to sell that property and moved out um, about three miles outside of town on Port Royal Road between Port Royal and Adams. And they then built a lodge hall, um, a two-story lodge hall, which stood until 1994. And I don't know if you recall, but during that time period, there was a spate of church burnings of African-American churches across the South. And the Benevolent Society Number no. 210 Lodge was one of those buildings that was um, destroyed by white arsonists. However, the Benevolent Society Lodge did not fold. They raised money, they rebuilt a new building, this brick building that we see here, um, which they dedicated in 2001, and not only did they rebuild, they commemorated their former lodge building with this plaque to talk about what happened and also a plaque for the picture of their original lodge building. So now I wanna sp speak at least a few minutes about some of the African-American lodges, which I believe operated and existed in Williamson County. And there were a number of different um, African-American groups that I have found that existed in Williamson County. So I know the Benevolent Society had lodges in Nolensville and Brentwood and possibly rural hill community. There was the Working People's Labor and Aid Association, which was a benevolent group. The Mosaic Templars, which I'll talk about more in just a moment. The Golden Star Society, uh, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, uh, the Masons, the Independent Order of Immaculates and the Sons of Temperance all seem to have had a presence in Williamson County. 
So the one I probably know, the ones that I know the most about would be the Benevolent Society. And this is one of the groups I've studied the most in depth. Um, and we do know there aren't, um, for a group that had lodges across the state, there aren't a lot of archival repositories that hold their information. But the State Archives in Nashville does have the copy of the proceedings from the 1926 statewide convention. So the Benevolent Society every August held a statewide convention of all their lodges. Delegates would come, they would have the elections for the statewide office, and they would, in the proceedings, they would print up like the different resolutions they had uh, voted on and if they passed or not. And as a boon to future researchers, they also put in the back, a list of every lodge they had in the state, the president of it, the secretary, how many members they had, and how much property they owned in that year, which is a great resource. So we know that in 1926, at least in Williamson County, these were the Benevolent Society Lodges that existed. As you can see, Grimwood had four different Benevolent Society Lodges with a number of members, and they did own property. And the interesting thing, too, about Benevolent Society Lodges is that um, they really run the gamut. So some are just for males, some are just for females, like, and they're known as the Ladies Benevolent Society, and some are mixed gender. And I have yet to find a rhyme or reason as to why this is. I think it really depended on the community and what type of Benevolent Society Lodge they wanted to create. In the mixed gender lodges, uh, Benevolent Society would also allow females to be officers. So as you can see, uh, lodge number 109 in Brentwood in that year had a male president, but a female secretary as well. So uh, Franklin was also the state headquarters for the Mosaic Templars. So the Mosaic Templars were an African-American uh, benevolent group. They were started in the 1890s in Little Rock, Arkansas. One of the organizers, J.E. Bush, was actually a native of Tennessee. He was born in slavery in Moscow, Tennessee, over in West, West Tennessee. Um, they were originally started to help widows and orphans of African-Americans in Little Rock. They soon spread throughout the Southeast. They had lodges in Tennessee and Arkansas, uh, Alabama, several states. And Franklin became the state headquarters of the organization by the 1920s. And their headquarters were located on 419 Columbia Avenue. Um, they don't seem to, have, this group did not survive the Great Depression. However, there is a Mosaic Templars Cultural Center in Little Rock in the former uh, building where the national headquarters were. Now that building did suffer a fire and they lost a lot of their records um, in the 1990s. Uh, but they have a lot of great information and they're trying to recreate how many lodges there were out there at the Mosaic Templars. And they sent me this really great uh, letterhead from that shows that Franklin was the state headquarters and that the president at that time was J.W. Reddick, who was the state grand master from Franklin. And this is a letter from Mr. Reddick to a lodge sister. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't say which town she lived in, but he's stating that uh, he can't come to Moscow on the 23rd like he wanted uh, because the doctor said he needed to stay in a few days, but that he would be visiting soon and that, you know, he tells her that he'll be there on March 31st and when to have her lodges ready to meet, which I thought was a really great um, artifact and example of a lodge that was operating in here in Franklin at that time. Another group that I study that had a presence in Franklin was the Independent Order of Immaculates. And they're a group that I really hope to focus on and learn more about. Um, they originally started in Nashville in 1868 and they were known as the Young Men's Immaculate Association. And they were a benevolent group, but they also had a, like a strong uh, Christian um, ethic to them. Um, there, in 1872, a successor group was organized called the Independent Order of Immaculates. And they had lodges, um, Tennessee, Texas, Ohio, Mississippi, uh, they paid sickness, accident, and disability benefits. So if you got sick or became disabled, they would pay a small benefit weekly usually to you or to your family. And you have to really think like in a time before their social security benefits or workers' compensation or um, unemployment uh, benefits. This may have been the difference, the thing that would have allowed you to put food on your table or to help pay your rent or to take care of your family. And that's really what these organizations have to get. That's the gap that they fill um, in the African-American community at the time. 
um, there was an immaculate hall in Franklin. Um, I'm still trying to figure out where that was um, because Undertaker H.J. Ewing in um, he has something in the Nashville Globe, um, and I did a terrible thing in it for the year, but it's around 1913, where he says that he is located at the IOI Hall with, where he has his showroom. And there was a Golden Fleece Lodge number 92 was the one that was existed in Franklin. The Masons also had a presence in Franklin. Um, Olive Branch Lodge number seven, which was established in 1874, um, and between 1877 and 1944, they shared a building with the Christian church on Cumming Street. And that's really, you see that a lot in African-American lodges across the state. They oftentimes shared a building with a church or another lodge or sometimes even a school. Uh, more than one group would use the building. So they're really like multi-purpose buildings that are for the community. And at a time of like tightening segregation, they're a place where the African-American community can go and can meet and can come together and have events um, and opportunities for events that they wouldn't have in the larger white society at the time. In 1944, uh, the Masonic Lodge in Franklin, they moved to a building on Green Street, which to my understanding, they still meet at today. Other groups in Williamson County uh, that I had mentioned before, the Knights of Pythias um, had lodges in Franklin. Uh, there's a note from 1909 uh, stating that they were had a, a special event at the AME Church um, for their eighth annual Thanksgiving sermon. So a lot of lodges once a year would have a sermon, um, either in a Thanksgiving sermon or their annual sermon. And they were interesting in that they were ecumenical. So whatever preacher they asked to preach at them, it rotated every year. So it wasn't as if, oh, the Masons always asked the Baptists or you know, the Immaculates only have AME preachers. They really seemed to rotate it through the community. Um, and it was an opportunity, there would be a sermon, there was usually singing, there'd be other speeches, often a picnic or a dinner on the grounds as well, would be part of it too. There was also, uh, there was a court of Palente that operated. They're an auxiliary of the Oddfellows. Um, there were the Taborians. I believe there's also the United Brothers and Sisters, excuse me, the United Brothers of Friendship and the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten um, also had a lodge in Franklin as well. So I just want to thank you all for listening to me tonight. I hope I didn't speak too quickly. Um, as Rachel said, my book came out actually today, I think, is the official release date. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, um, at Vanderbilt University Press, their online site, or anywhere you find your online books. Um, and I guess if anyone has questions, I would be happy to answer any of them. And I will also uh, look in the chat um, as well. Um, and I see Yeah, that if anyone has questions, just put them in the, in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the, the Zoom. One of the last things you said, you said that um, fraternal organizations would oftentimes, or benevolent organizations would share space with other groups. That reminded me, um, I was looking through school board minutes in Williamson County. Um, it's like 1918 or 1919, the uh, Mosaic Templars had permission, I think, to build a room onto the Thompson Station African American School. Um, oh, yes, well, I, I made a note of that. Right, yeah, it's really interesting. So lodges, um, it's a, a very symbiotic relationship, like they're really invested in their communities. And so they're usually will share their space with the school or school will share space with them or they're, as you say, will add on um, to accommodate mm -hmm. a school. Um, and I find it's, I just find it fascinating just how often you see it across the state. Um, well, one person asked, will we put any links in the chat? Um, any, any links to your research that we can post for people to, to look at um you know yes um let me stop my share and see if i can <laughs> um i have a, an older blog site that um, i've written a lot about um, different lodges across the state let me see if i can get that link real quick and put it there as well So I remember some of those maps were on your older blog, or at least older versions of those maps that you showed earlier. Definitely. And here's a link to the blog. Um, okay, there it is. Up. I have, yep. So definitely um, haven't updated as much as I should. 
but I'm happy to, um, if anyone has, you know, has any other questions too. Um, let's see. So there's a question if I'm aware that the Mosaic Templars may have met in the Natchez district. Yes, they probably, I would not be surprised if they did. Um, the only problem with the Mosaic Templars is because of the fire at their headquarters in Little Rock, they don't have really great records about where all the different lodges were located. So it's more of a piecemeal um, trying to figure out where all their lodges were. But I would not be surprised at all if there was one in the Natchez district. Um, I have a question. So uh, the benevolent organizations that offered economic benefits, um, I, mean, I mean, they're benevolent, but were they, were they, could you, would you consider them businesses? So yes and no. And that's actually what got several of them in trouble and why several of them um, stopped existing in the, um, around the time of World War I and the Great Depression. So they to offer these benefits, you would pay, you would have an initiation fee, and then you would pay dues. And dues were like maybe between 50 cents to a dollar per month. Um, and so from my understanding, the problem with a lot of the groups is as their membership aged, they had not really been based on actuarial principles. And so they simply just ran out of money as they had an aging population. Oh, thank you. I, have a message we see, uh, send them from Ms. Hankins. Uh, I thank you for um, the congratulations on the research. Um, what about you? So you talked a lot about cemeteries and the fact that lodges created these places for African Americans to be to be buried. What about if we need these cemeteries? Can we see headstones that these organizations um, erected or as part of their 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 burial benefits? Yes, absolutely, and I'm so glad you asked. So um, several, okay, so in the Benevolent Society, several of the cemeteries have um, a marker of some sort that's dedicated just to the lodge itself. So I have found those at um, the Benevolent Society cemeteries in Murfreesboro, in Port Royal, um, in Shebel, several places. Uh, the other interesting thing about in several of these lodge cemeteries is that they may have been organized by a lodge. So, for example, Mount Ararat down in Chapel was started by the Ladies Benevolent Society number 44. But when you go to their cemetery, I have found lodge uh, tombstones from the Mosaic Templars, from the Knights of Pythias, their Masonic tombstones, as well as the Benevolent Society tombstone as well, and an Odd Fellows, if I recall. So, I think it's really interesting so that. Uh, the, my first thought when I first started my research was that, oh, if a lodge created a cemetery, it's just for the members of those lodge. Well, one thing I quickly learned is that people were often members of multiple lodges and that there didn't seem to be a lot of jealousy between like, oh, you're a benevolent society member, you can't be a Pythian. Um, and so they really seem to have opened their cemeteries to like anyone in the African-American community. Um, Let's see, someone asked if there were lodges or society in Thompson Station or Spring Hill. Yes, I feel very confident that I'm recalling a mention of a lodge in Spring Hill and Thompson Station, definitely with the Benevolent Society. Um, but if here, I'm going to put my email in the chat. If someone wants to email me specifically about like a community, I'm happy to look and see if I have if I've come across any mention in my research. So what got started on this? What, what was the first thing that sparked the interest in this research? So interestingly enough, so um, I went back to grad school um, in 2010 and I was in my 30s. So I felt, um, now I look back and laugh, but I felt quite old compared to some of my fellow students and colleagues. Um, and I was in a class and there was a professor who we were doing a class project on the cemetery community in Rutherford County. So. Uh, prior classes had gathered information about different aspects of community life. Um, that's a community that's where the Stones River National Battlefield is and was, um, had to, the um, government had to buy the property from uh, what was primarily an African American community to create the battlefield. And so we were tasked with creating an online exhibit about some aspect of life in cemetery. And I came across a deed for the Working People's Labor and Aid Association. And I thought that was the most interesting sounding group I'd ever heard of. So I asked the professor, I said, hey, that's a really cool group. Like, 
do we know anything about them? And she said, no, I can't find anything. And you wouldn't be able to find anything either. Um, and as my, anyone who is part of my family can tell you the quickest way to get me to do something is to tell me that I can't. Um, and so I wanted to see what I could find out just to prove her wrong. Um, and with some lucky research breaks, particularly at the Rutherford County Archives, uh, there's a, they were involved in a lawsuit um, in the group. There was a lawsuit within the group um, in 1914 in Murfreesboro, like it split into two and they had a fight over the lodge building. Um, and it was really like a working a fight between like if they're gonna be working class or if they're gonna move more into the middle class. And that's really what started me is that researching that group and then I would find mentions of other groups and then it became a rabbit hole that I haven't escaped um, in the last decade. Um, I know from, from working in Arkansas that there, that a lot of these benevolent organizations, because that they were somewhat so like businesses and in, insurance providers, um, that the state somewhat regulated them and that there are like, um, the state has like insurance records that they published yearly that would list the organization, the size of the organization and how much capital they had. Is there something you think similar to like that in Tennessee? Yes, and that's how I found some of the groups and found out that some were still operating as late as the 20s was uh, coming through insurance records, uh, uh, um, reports of the commissioner of insurance that would report on basically their financial health, um, how much money mm -hmm. they had on the books, things like that. Yeah, someone asked if, if I could share information about the Mosaic Templars and Thompson Station, the school, and I just happened to be able to pull it up pretty easily. Here, can y'all see that? Am I sharing my screen properly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it says, we, the County Board of Williamson County, Tennessee, do grant and give the Lily of the East Chamber number 3654 Mosaic Templars of America the right to build a lodge room on colored schoolhouse grounds at Thompson Station, Tennessee to be laid off by Walter, maybe Petaway, a member mm -hmm. of this board. Um, this building is to be used for lodge and funeral purposes exclusively under no condition shall it be used for dances. <laughs> I forgot about that part. <laughs> uh, this building may uh, be a one or two story as they see fit. Um, this land by no means is given or sold to the lodge. I understood that this lodge at any maintained time um, without consulting the board, without consulting the board. If y'all want to read the rest, there it is. But I, I was looking at school board records, and that just there it was. I thought that's very interesting, and I actually sent it to Brian McDade at the Mosaic Templars. I saw that you. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I think if I recall, and I could be mixing it up. I think chambers were um, for male members, and temples were female lodges. Mm -hmm. Usually, um, I may have that mixed up though. Right. Right. Yeah. All right, we have any more questions? Well, is there anything that you that you else you want to talk about? Let's see, we've got a question from Andy Floyd Hamilton. Um, what roles did the lodges, societies, et cetera, play in African American education? They, in my opinion, have a, a pretty big role in African American education. As I've mentioned before, it's not uncommon for African American lodges to um, have school, like to allow schools to meet in their lodge buildings. Um, they also, so many of them, when you look at their constitutions or their articles of incorporation, a big part of their purpose they will talk about is to educate the young. And it really highlights this belief and this need to help the next generation uh, be better and to have more um, and then that included education it's really quite fascinating um i feel like lodges had a very large role in african-american life in general more so than has been given credit um in addition to education like i found examples where the masons in memphis were holding boulder registration drives um before the um, NAACP did like in the early 50s 
uh, they were also like, there was a Masonic group in Knoxville that was trying to build a housing de um, development um, in the early 50s. So I feel like African-American lodges just were uniquely part of a, a lot of different aspects of African-American life. So do you know how many lodges are currently active? That's something I was about to ask too, is how many of these organizations are still around? You know, um, some of the fraternal groups are still active, like the Masons and the Elks. And in fact, the Odd Fellows, I've been in contact. Um, so the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows was the African-American counterpart of the White Odd Fellows. They were no longer active in Tennessee, but they, within the last year or two have created a couple lodges here in Tennessee and have reactivated, which I think is fantastic. Um, some of the smaller groups no longer seem to be active, um, though, as I said, the Benevolent Society number 210 in Port Royal seems to still be going strong. They, I think they still even have a scholarship they give out and like an annual barbecue um, that I've seen mention of. So I think it really depends on the community. In general, um, most historians and anthropologists seem to believe that lodge life really declined in American society as a whole, um, beginning during the Great Depression, and particularly after World War II, for a number of reasons. Um, the Great Depression certainly didn't help. Uh, if you don't have money, if you lose your job, you definitely can't pay your lodge fees. Um, and then I think, too, after World War II, just the shift in entertainment and opportunities um, that were open in larger society, just, lot, you know, some of the smaller lodges can no longer compete. Um, you just mentioned anthropologists. That reminded me, um, Hortense Powdermaker in her book, After Freedom, she's, uh, you know, she spent, I don't know, I don't know how long she spent. She was in Indianola, Mississippi, I think in like 1927. Uh, she calls it Cottondale in the book. Um, but she talks about fraternal organizations. And I think she makes the point that women tended to, that was, women tended to stay members longer because they thought it was part of their duty to take care of their families and, and to maintain their benefits in case they, they, they died or got sick, that they would have a, you know, a safety net. So have you found anything like that in, in Tennessee or? I have actually, I, there have found several um, anthropologists who definitely believe that um, for African-American women, lodge membership um, was part of like their, their notion of care like that the greater that they owed a duty to care for like their larger community like this familial type of obligation and that it really um, bled over into lodge life and I do think that's true I have I come across so many mentions of women being involved in lodge work across the state um, so I don't think it was just the men I think unfortunately in a lot of histories like the men get more attention just because there's more mentions of them but I think from what I found, women were very active in lodge life. And as I agree with Hortense Powdermaker, I, I have found what she said about Indianola seems to hold true for Tennessee as well. Uh, one thing about Powdermaker, I, I, so the research I, I did, um, it seems like Mississippi had much, I guess, you know, Mississippi passed laws that were much more res restrictive about fraternal organization and benevolent organizations like requiring them have so much capital on hand to offer um, to offer insurance. I think that probably impacted who became members. Oh, Powdermaker doesn't talk about that, but it seems like when I visited cemeteries in Arkansas and visited cemeteries in Mississippi, in Arkansas, you see a lot more fraternal headstones than, than you do in Mississippi. And I think that probably those state laws and restrictions, which um, were probably helped in the long run when the depression hit and a lot of those organizations went, went bankrupt. Right, yeah, there's right actually, I think it was the uh, Mobile Law, is a, a, there was also a federal law, I believe, too, okay. known as the Mobile Law, that did um, specify that if you're a fraternal lodge, that you had to have a certain amount in reserves, um, and that was the death knell of several of like, the smaller benevolent groups, because they just could not meet those requirements. But I do think, um, in particular, like Mississippi and Arkansas, I do think some of their, their large life does seem to be a little different. So, you know, in Mississippi, the Knights of Tabor, they actually opened a hospital in um, Mound Bayou up in northern Mississippi that operated until, I believe, like the 60s or 70s. Like the 70s, yeah. Yeah, right. And I think uh, the buildings are still there. I think there's an organization that's hoping to, like, restore them and interpret them, and, you know, create something of a cultural center. 
uh, to interpret life in a mountain bayou. Um, so I do think lodge life may have been stronger there in some ways, yeah. um, for sure. So uh, these organizations that still exist, like the benevolent one, um, did you get to witness any of their rituals or are those still alive and active or? You know, I'm not sure. Um, and I haven't, um, I don't want to like intrude um, in a group that I, I'm not a part of. I do wonder, so I, I didn't really get to mention it, though I do talk about it in my book. Several of the groups have burial rituals, which I found fascinating. The Benevolent Society has a, a published burial ritual, um, as did the Odd Fellows, um, the Immaculates. Uh, There's a group out in LaGuardo that had a burial ritual as well. I am curious if they still do that or if Mm -hmm. that's no longer a part of what they do um and the burial rituals were fascinating they uh, on the surface look to be very like judeo-christian in their uh, references and in their scripture readings but they do some things that uh there's uh, oh, i think she's an anthropologist betty kike um talks about that may have some like parallels to african like west african tribal um, burial rituals uh, which is fascinating such as um the lodge will when, when a deceased member dies, they would go to the home, they would first go to the lodge hall, have a service. There are certain things they say, there's call and response um, at each part of the ritual, which I find very interesting between the membership and the president or the chaplain. They then process as a group to the deceased person's house and like the president goes to the head of the deceased and the chaplain goes to the foot and there are certain things that they say. They then um, process with the body to the, the site of the burial where the lodge continues to have a ritual until they bury them. And I would be curious to know if these groups still do that. Yeah, and some of these things are really just hard. It's hard to get good sources. A lot of the, the you know, all these organizations, if they kept records, they just didn't get saved. Um, have you found any like just really cool finds of, of paper records being saved? You, you mentioned the one at the at TSLA. Any other like lodge records that survived or ledger? Right. So I recently found that the Immaculates, that their constitution, um, a copy of it at a university, I think Stanford, out in California, and they were nice enough to send me a PDF copy of it. Um, and I'm just now starting to kind of dig through it to see what all is in there. Um, that was my favorite find. That I had. The other big find is just whoever decided to digitize newspapers and put them on Chronicling America, like I would love to shake their hand because there's so much I have found in the National Globe and in other newspapers that make mentions of lodges and like what they were doing and like the events they had. And that has just been such a boon for researchers, I feel. All right. I was going to share my screen one more time and put a picture of your book. I just found it. There we go. But you keep that yet, can you? There we go. All right. So in, anything else we should know about your about your book or your research that's coming up or or any other no, talks I, I that just, you're doing in the in the area? <laughs> um, I will be uh, speaking at the um, Heritage Center in Murfreesboro. I'm not sure exactly sure of the date yet, but sometime soon. Um, and I'll be speaking up at uh, Jonesboro this weekend um, to the Jonesboro Genealogical Society, but more about um, different African American records, like how to find your ancestors in um, unusual places. Um, which including our uh, lodge records is one of the things I'll be talking about. Oh, and there also the ASALH. Um, I'll be doing a book talk on February 24th um, as part of their virtual book fair um, event. All right. Well, Leanne, uh, well, we've got one more question. Um, I have a photo of the 1926 State Grand Lodge meeting of the United Brothers of Friendship meeting in Franklin. See, I knew the United Brothers of Friendship were in Franklin at some point. I, yeah. That is fantastic. All right. Well, uh, if you want to share that with Anne, you can, you've got her email address. Um, and, uh, so this was a really, really interesting, great talk. Congratulations on the book. And um, we, oh, they said they got the photo from Rick Warwick. So I bet if you go to Rick's Flickr account, you could probably find that 
find that. I think maybe we saw that when we were working on our panels. Yeah. But great, interesting subject. We uh, are looking forward to the book that just came out today. So we haven't got a chance to look at it, but it's we're gonna we're gonna enjoy it. So thank you so much, Anne. And thanks yeah, thank for everyone so for for joining us today. All right. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. I want to end the meeting. Okay. But I found it. <laughs>